Hello everyone, I'm your host PensyFan19 and welcome to the December 2022 PensyFan Periodical. This is the monthly news series which covers most of the major rarity headlines from around the world, as well as my opinions on them. We have a lot of articles to go over today, so with that in mind, let's get rolling. First off, this would technically be a follow-up story, but Amtrak has released an updated passenger rail proposal map at a board meeting, this time featuring multiple updates from their previous Connexus map. Not only does this map have a different style from Conexus, but it also includes new destinations for long distance, high speed rail, and commuter rail routes for the nation. Although, the only high speed rail corridor indicated in the map is California High Speed Rail, while the commuter routes are also limited to California, with what looks like extended service for Metrolink, Ace Train, Smart Train, and Caltrain, as well as an interesting new route between Huron and Strathmore on the San Joaquin Valley Railroad. As far as long distance proposals go, the North Coast Hiawatha is finally included on this map after being left out of the Conexus map, there's also the restoration of the Sunset Limited to Orlando, and a semi-recently discussed service to use the Shreveport racetrack to Fort Worth. Now, many of the regional proposals are… interesting to say the least, and that's not counting the exclusion of multiple routes including NYC to Ronkakuma and Allentown, Chicago to Rockland and Iowa City, St. Paul to Duluth, Charlotte to Asheville, Raleigh to Wilmington, Boston to Concord, Detroit to Toronto, Atlanta to Birmingham, and most surprisingly Atlanta to Nashville. Despite a good number of routes being missing, this new map definitely fills in the gap by including a lot of rather unusual or unorthodox routings. Some examples include making partial regional corridors of long distance route like the Pioneer between Salt Lake City and Boise instead of continuing to Seattle, and then the primary method of placing a random town that recently expressed interest in passenger service and drawing a line to the nearest town on the map, with almost no regard for previous passenger service. Although it would take some time to go over every single new route in the map, I'll point out three of the most obvious examples of this draw a line to the nearest town map method. Exhibit A, Columbus to Athens, Ohio. This route runs on ex-New York Central present-day Norfolk Southern trackage, but neglects to continue along the former NYC passenger service that ran all the way down to Charlottetown, West Virginia. Exhibit B, Kansas City to Branson, Missouri. This follows an ex-Missouri Pacific present-day Missouri Northern Arkansas route that will either start from Kansas City or split from Joplin after traveling on the Kansas City Southern. I feel this is a pretty awkward terminus and would be better off as an inner city line between Kansas City and Little Rock, Arkansas, or as a branch line of the Texas Eagle to Kansas City. Exhibit C Erie, Pennsylvania to Binghamton, New York I'm not sure what the origin of this line is, but its long route underneath Buffalo doesn't suggest it as a terminus, unless if it spurs off right before Salamanca. Otherwise, it would continue west and terminate at either Erie, Pennsylvania or Cleveland, since there's no other routing that faces the ex-Erie present-day Western New York and PA Railroad towards Buffalo. That, and I'm also not sure why it couldn't easily connect with Scranton, thus restoring the Phoebe Snow between New York and Buffalo via Binghamton. With all that said, I strongly recommend the use of three sources for properly designing pasture rail proposals. Streamlinermemories.info, a website with multiple Class 1 timetables from various decades in PDF format, Bob Cosby's Railroad Line, Pasture Train, and Station Index, howdyall.com slash trains, an archive of almost every single pasture train and scheduling for almost every single American railroad, and Rail Guide, an app that shows past and present day right of ways and their original owners on an interactive map, and helps me verify most of these proposals and even help me with other videos. Although some of these routes have questionable routing, it's still great to see that so many towns are interested in pasture rail and I hope that most if not all of them are brought into fruition, including all of those left out from the Conexus map. Out of all the routes listed here, I would have to say Kansas City to St. Paul is my favorite since it highlights a way too often overlooked corridor of connecting services that avoid larger cities, especially since there used to be so many little known passenger services in this region of the Midwest. Speaking of which, here is some interesting news. Also as a bit of a follow up story, SEPTA is considering the use of Class 230 Viva Rail D trains trialed by Pop-Up Metro for restoring service on their Westchester branch and possibly for other diesel branches, which might be hindered by Viva Rail's application for board members, which caused LNWR to temporarily suspend their Class 230s until the company officially names board members. Speaking of importing foreign rolling stock to North America, 
X Cobrel SW1001 start to replace GE center caps at the National Steel Car Plant in Ontario. Great Western Railway has returned their Trimode Class 769s due to various technical issues. Mr. Beast has released footage of GSMR 777 being rammed into a brick wall and five trailers. Nice to see it being used for stunts like this if it was slated to be scrapped anyways. An OBB Taurus has been wrapped in a Gus of Beer ad. E-scooters are now banned from Transpennine Express stations. The New Jersey Turnpike Authority is to help fund the Gateway Project. NASA is to build roads on the moon. And SNCF has begun testing their Flexi Road Rail vehicle, which will travel onto the roads in an... Uh... Interesting concept, to say the least. I don't know why since the technology isn't new, but there's something uncanny about a passenger rail car moving onto the road like that. Now here's the follow-up news section for articles covering stories from previous episodes. First of all, Amtrak has officially released concept art of the long-awaited Amfleet replacements, now called the Amtrak Aero. I assume the Aero name will only apply to this ALC 42 style cab on venture cars, but the final design doesn't look too different from the initial sketch about a year ago. Even though I feel the livery for the Aero isn't the most detailed, at least the light blue ovals make it look different when compared to the past liveries. The Cascade set that was also released the same day looks incredible as well, as their interior looks much more comfortable and overall a huge improvement from the Amfleet and Horizons. Although, I must say I'm not too surprised about the design of the Aero, since not only is it similar to Phase 7, but someone on Steam made a prediction of what the Venture Cab would look like about a year ago, and for the most part it looks like they were more than close enough to the final product. Except for the Cascade set, that beige on the front thankfully turned out to be green. Continuing with Amtrak, they finally reached a final decision with the Class 1s to start passenger service on the Gulf Coast route as early as 2023. Via Rail has officially established a subsidiary to develop their high-frequency rail corridor. The Golden Pass Express has entered service in Switzerland. Port Authority has released concept art of a replacement Newark Air Train. And NJT has re recommended light rail and bus service to replace their Dinky Shuttle, along with concept art- Oh no. That just looks wrong. Can we just not follow the trend that incorporates roads into rails and odd-looking trams like this? Can we just not? Please? Thanks. In other news, Metro North has started groundbreaking for Penn Station access while also releasing concept art for the four new stations. It's certainly nice to see that almost all of them will have four tracks in the right-of-way, so this way there's enough room for Metro North and Amtrak along with CSX. Meanwhile, Brightline opened their Aventura and Boca Raton stations, with the former also having low-level platforms for future commuter rail service. MBTA has opened their Freetown, Massachusetts station, even though passenger service there isn't scheduled to start for another year. MBTA has officially opened their Green Line extension to Medford Tufts, with many people being hyped for the opening. Eastside access has been delayed to January, as they'll start with Jamaica to Grand Central shuttles for the first few weeks of service. Denver's RTD has discontinued the C and F light rail lines, since they are already covered by other lines. The Biden Express has started service around Biden's Christmas tree. Ace Train has begun operating on vegetable oil instead of diesel. Santa Cruz is to study passenger service restoration. Lionel Messi won his first World Cup as Argentina won the 2022 FIFA World Cup. The Jade Dragon Snow Mountain Railway has officially opened. CRRC has revealed their Orange Phoenix Type DEMU, while the Osaka Metro has revealed their Octagon-shaped 400 class. Siemens has revealed their S700 for TriMet, while Siemens Vectron has been repainted with a lot of horses for TX Logistic, NS take note. Meanwhile, the Dutch NS has ordered new bylevels from CAF, while Stadler is to supply tram links to Geneva and Sally's to Taiwan. SNCB is giving their tracks engines more personality with slight livery differences. St. Nile Railway has opened their rebuilt Clifton shops. PRRB6 Class No. 60 has been donated to the Lewis Junction Railroad. And both New York Central Electrics have been saved and are currently awaiting a final move to the Danbury Railway Museum. However, costs are still needed for this move, so any donation to the museum will be greatly appreciated. After all that, it is now time for this month's Meme of the Month. This month's Meme of the Month is... No Defects Detectors. And now, the top story of the December 2022 Pensy Fan Periodical is... Ontario Northland purchases Siemens Chargers! In a surprise for almost everyone, a Canadian Class 2 has recently placed an order for three SCV-42 train sets, consisting of a Canadian nose, 
two venture coaches in a cab car in order to run on the soon-to-be-restored Northlander between Toronto and Coltrane, Ontario. Not only does this news confirm the first use of brand new pasture equipment by a railroad that hauls both pastures and freight, but it also solidifies the return of the Northlander, since its restoration has been a topic of debate for many Canadian politicians since the land was discontinued about a decade ago. But now to purchase a brand new train set is one of the last signs of reassurance that this vital pasture train will be restored, thus showing that the railroad and Ontario politicians are fully committed to the plan. As far as the train set itself, the combination of blue and yellow is a simple yet iconic livery for the train set, as the safety stripes on the front are a nice touch as well, since the rugged nose of the SCV-42 gives the set a tough yet stylish look, and makes it my personal favorite Charger variant. Although, three cars is a relatively short consist, and Owen stated that they'll only purchase a total of three sets since the Northlander isn't meant to be too frequent, so it might run alongside recently refurbished Owen Pastor stock instead of replacing them, but only time will tell. Overall, it's great to see that the return of the Northlander was solidified with one of the greatest looking railcar sets in years, as this small but iconic Siemens Charger train set brings a stylish modernity to the smallest of regional railroads. Now that this channel has existed for more than two years, I'd like to continue the annual tradition of including a top story of the year for the last periodical of that year, in which one of the top stories is further analyzed and reflected upon. For 2022, the top story of the year goes to... STRIKE AVERTED! If there's one struggle that rail fans and common folk alike have been following, it's undoubtedly the American freight rail strike between Class 1 workers and corporate executives. News for this ongoing story has been changing on a daily basis, and there are plenty of other channels to cover the situation in much more detail, so I'll try my best to keep this explanation brief but informative. The real beginning of this story started almost a decade ago, when multiple Class 1s adopted an operating system known as Precision Schedule Railroading, or PSR, which was created by former CSX CEO Hunter Harrison. This system essentially attempted to streamline railroad operations by making trains longer with fewer engines, crews, sidings, and switching operations in order to save costs and increase profits. Despite sounding good for some on paper, this led to multiple issues including short staffing, long delays due to not enough track space, long working hours for long distances, and relatively low pay and benefits for engineers. Likewise, the most recent contract for railroad work was made back in 2018 with no plans for the Class 1s to renew these union contracts, an increased strain on the freight railroads eventually led to 99.5% of rail workers to vote in favor of a strike in July. Just before the strike day came, however, President Biden established an emergency board to negotiate with the Class 1s and union members, which granted a cool-off period to September 16th, while most of the unions involved rejected the proposed contract terms. By this time, there was much more talk of a nationwide strike as freight and passenger railroads started modifying their schedules as the story made headlines around the world. But once again, just before the strike deadline, tentative agreements were set in place that prevented a nationwide strike, as the tentative date was pushed back to November and then December before Biden established new legislation that essentially prevents workers from striking altogether, with only a few unions rejecting the contract terms this time. Despite the attempts for the Class 1s to improve working conditions and public relations, Many railroads are still trying to employ cost-cutting measures, including embargoes on certain shippers for local service for overworking the railroad's fleet, and by relocating conductors to dispatched pickup trucks in order to utilize one-man crews. What concerns me about this whole story personally is that during one of the handful of instances where the rail industry gains the spotlight of the mass media, most stories covering the potential strike only mention the costly delays it would have on the economy and consumers, instead of discussing the root problems that led to the strike. That's why it's vital to have other news sources to properly cover the story, and any story for that matter, from various perspectives, in order to have a complete picture of the issue at hand. Likewise, many rail fans have called for the nationalization of the freight railroads in order to guarantee better working conditions, and while I don't necessarily support full nationalization since it would be adding a huge system in the federal DOT's budget, I would support increased regulation of the freight railroads so that workers are insured certain benefits as well as offering tax incentives to hire more people, add more tracks, and run more trains instead of cutting back. If such steps are taken, then the American freight rail industry will not only become more efficient in the short and long terms, but it will also become the most innovative by investing their profits to expand their system under fair regulations, as I will continue to support any rail worker and train enthusiast alike who also want such goals for the greater American rail network. 
Thank you everyone for watching this month's episode of the Pansy Fan Periodical. There have been a lot of real news headlines for the month, and it will be very interesting to see what the future has in store for all of these articles. Thank you again for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more. Have a good day.